So in one of Lacan's seminars, he uses the term familiar, and um, while going through Freud's collected works, I found the reference, Freud, and the English translation of that word is familiarly. So there's about a 10 or so pages where the term is repeated in the entire 5,000 or so pages. And here are the extracted pages. So I'm going to read them. First page is 1618 and it's from jokes and their relation to the unconscious. If this last point is developed further, the contrast between sense and nonsense becomes significant. What at one moment has seemed to us to have meaning, to, to have a meaning, we now see is completely meaningless. That is what, in this case, constitutes the comic process. A remark seems to us to be a joke if we attribute a significance to it that has psychological necessity and, as soon as we have done so, deny it again. Various things can be understood by this significance. We attach sense to a remark and know that logically it cannot have any. We discover truth in it, which nevertheless, nevertheless, according to the laws of experience of our general habits of thought, we cannot find in it. We grant it logical or practical consequence. We grant it logical or practical consequences in excess of its we grant it logical or practical consequences in excess of its true content only to deny these consequences as soon as we have clearly recognized the nature of the remark in every instance the psychological process which the joking remark provokes in us and on which the feeling of the comic rests consists in the immediate transition from this attaching of sense, from this discovering the truth, and from this granting of consequences to the consciousness or impression of relative nothingness. However penetrating this discussion may sound, the question may be raised here whether the contrast between what has meaning and what is meaningless, on which the feeling of the comic is set to rest also contributes to defining the concept of the joke insofar as it differs from that of the comic. The factor of bewilderment and illumination, too, leads us deep into the problem of the relation of the joke to the comic. Kant says of the comic in general that it has the remarkable characteristic of being able to deceive us only for a moment. Heyman's 1896 explains how the effect of a joke comes about through bewilderment being succeeded by illumination. He illustrates his meaning by a brilliant joke of Highness, who makes one of his characters, Hirsch Hyacinth, the poor lottery agent, boast that the great Baron Rothschild has treated him, has, has treated him as his equal, quite familiarly. Here the word is the vehicle of the joke appears at first <clears throat> of the joke had the, of the joke appears at first simply to be a wrongly constructed word something unintelligible incomprehensible puzzling it accordingly bewilders the comic effect is produced by the solution of this bewilderment by bewilderment word means this or that, uh, by bewilderment, by understanding the word. Lips, 1898-95, adds to this that this first stage of enlightenment that the bewildering word means this or that is followed by a second stage in which we realize that this meaningless word has bewildered us and has then shown us its true meaning. It is only this second illumination, 
This discovery that a word which is meaningless by normal linguistic usage has been responsible for the whole thing. This resolution of the problem into nothing. It is only this second illumination that produces the comic effect. Page 1619, still the same text. Whether the one or the other of these two views seems to us to throw more light on the question, the discussion of bewilderment and enlightenment brings us closer to a particular discovery. For if the comic defect of Heinus familiarly depends on, that's from who it comes from originally, Heinus, Heinus familiarly depends on the solution of the apparently meaningless word, the joke must no doubt be ascribed to the formations of that word to the characteristics of the word thus formed. Another peculiarity of jokes, quite unrelatable to what we have just been considering, is recognized by the authorities as essential to them. Brevity is the body and the soul of wit, is its very self, says John Paul, 1804, Part 2, Paragraph 42, merely modifying what the old chatterbox Polonius says in Shakespeare's Hamlet 2-2. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, it will be brief. In this connection, the account given by Lips, 1898-90, of the brevity of jokes is significant. A joke says what it has to say, not always in few words, but in too few words. That is, in words that are insufficient by strict logic or by common modes of thought and speech. It may even actually say what it has to say by not saying it. We have already learned from the connection of jokes with, caricat with caricature that they must bring forward something that is concealed or hidden. Fisher, 1889-51. If I lay stress on this determinant once more, because it too has more to do with the nature of jokes than with their being part of the comic. Page 1622, part 2, The Technique of Jokes. Let us follow up. A leader presented, let us follow up a lead presented to us by chance and consider the first example of a joke that we came across in the preceding chapter. In the part of his Reisbild, Reisbilder, entitled Die Bade von Luca, Heine introduces the delightful figure of the lottery agent and extractor of corns, Hirsch. Hyacinth of Hamburg, 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 who boasts to the poet of his relations of his relations with the wealthy Baron Roth, Rothschild, and finally says, and as true as God shall grant me all good things, Doctor, I sat beside Solomon Rothschild, and he treated me quite as his equal, quite familiarly. Haymans and Lips use this joke, which is admittedly an excellent and most amusing one, to illustrate their view that the comic effect of jokes is derived from bewilderment and illumination. See above. We, however, will leave the question on one side and ask another. What is it that makes Hirsch Hyacinth's remark into a joke? There can be only two possible answers. Either the thought expressed in the sentence possesses in itself the character of being a joke, or the joke resides in the expression which the thought has been given in the sentence. In whichever of these directions the character of being a joke may lie, we will pursue it further and try to lay hands on it. A thought can in general be expressed in various linguistic forms, in various words, that is, which can represent it with equal aptness. Hirsch Hyacinth's remark presents his thought in a particular form of expression, and as it seems to us, especially odd form, <coughs> and not the one which is most, <coughs> most 
easily <laughs> intelligible. <coughs> <coughs> Let us try to express the same thought as accurately as possible in other words. <coughs> Lips has already done so, and in that way has to some extent explained the poet's intention. He writes, 1898-87, Heine, as we understand it, means to say that his reception was on familiar terms, of the not uncommon kind, which does not, as a rule, gain an agreeableness from having a flavor of millionairedom, millionairedom about it. We shall not be altering the sense of this if we give it another shape which perhaps fits better into her highest sense speech. Rothschild treated me quite as his equal, quite familiarly, quite familiarly, that is, so far as a millionaire can. A rich man's condon, a rich, <coughs> a rich man's condens, condensation, a rich, a rich man's condescensions, we should add, always involves something not quite pleasant for whoever experiences it. We shall return to this same joke later on, as we shall then have occasion to make a correction in the translation of it given by lips, which our own version has taken it as its starting point. This, however, will not affect the discussion that follows here. Page 1624. In what, then, does the technique of this joke consist? What has happened to the thought as expressed, for instance, in our version, in order to turn it into a joke that made us laugh so heartily? Two things. As we learn by comparing our version with the poet's text, first, a considerable abbreviation has occurred. In order to express fully the thought contained in the joke, we were obliged to add to the words R. Treated me quite as his equal, quite familiarly, quite familiarly. A postscript which, reduced to its shortest terms, ran, that is, so far as a millionaire can, and even so, felt the need for a further explanatory sentence. The poet puts it far more shortly. Art treated me quite as his equal, quite familiarly. In the joke, the whole limitation added by the second sentence to the first, which reports the familiar treatment, has disappeared. But not quite without leaving a substitute from which we can reconstruct it. For a second change has also been made. The word familiar, familiarly, and the unjoking expression of the thought has been transformed in the text of the joke into familionar, familiarly, and there can be no doubt that it is precisely on this verbal structure that the joke's character as a joke and its power to cause a laugh depend. The newly constructed word coincides in its earlier portion with the familiar of the first sentence and its final syllables with the millionaire of the second sentence. It stands, as it were, for the millionaire, for the millionaire portion of the second sentence, and thus for the whole second sentence, and so puts us in a position to infer this, the second sentence that has been omitted in the text of the joke. It can be described as a composite structure made up of the two components familiar and millionar, and it is tempting to give a diagrammatic picture of the way in which it is derived from those two words. Familiar, millionar, familionar. This is equally true of lips. Tra Lips's translation, that's first footnote, second. The two words are printed, one in Roman and the other in Italic type, and the syllables common to them are to them both 
are printed in thick type. The second I, which is scarcely pronounced, could of course be left out of count. It seems probable that the fact of the two words having several syllables in common offered the joke technique the occasion for constructing the composite word. 1625. The process which has converted the thought into a joke can then be present, represented in the following manner, which may at first seem fantastic, but nevertheless produces precisely the outcome that is really before us. R treated me quite familiar, that is so far as millionaire can. Let us now imagine that a compressing force is brought to bear on these sentences, and that for some reason the second is the less resistant one. It is thereupon made to disappear, while its most important constituent, the word millionaire, which has succeeded in rebelling against being suppressed, is, as it were, pushed up against the first sentence, and fused with the element of that sentence which is so much like it familiar, and the chance possibility which thus arises of saving the essential part of the second sentence actually favors the dissolution of its other less important constituents. The joke is thus generated, or treated me quite famil on ar mili ar. If we leave out of account any such compressing force, which indeed is unknown to us, the process which the joke is formed by the, the process by which the joke is formed, that is, the joke technique, in this instance might be <clears throat> in this instance might be described as condensation accompanied by the formation of a substitute. And in the present example, the formation of the substitute consists in the making of a composite word. This composite word, familionar, which is unintelligible in itself but is immediately understood in its context and recognized as being full of meaning, is the vehicle of the joke's laughter compelling effect, the mechanism of which, however, is not made in any way clearer by our discovery of the joke technique. In what way can a linguistic process of condensation, accompanied by the formation of a substitute by means of a composite word, give us pleasure and make us laugh. This is evidently a different problem, whose treatment we may postpone till we have found a way of approaching it. For the present, we will keep to the technique of jokes. <clears throat> 1626. Our expectation that the technique of jokes cannot be a matter of indifference from the point of view of discovering their essence, their essence leads us at once to inquire whether there are other examples of jokes constructed like Heine's Familionat. There are not very many of them, but nevertheless, enough to make up a small group which are characterized by the formation of composite words. Heine himself has derived the second joke from the word Millionat, copying from himself, as it were, in chapter 14 of his Aideen. He speaks of a Millionat which is an obvious combination of millionar and nar. And just as it, in the first example, brings out a suppressed subsidiary thought. Here are some other examples I have come upon. There is a certain fountain, Brunner, 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 in Berlin, the erection of which brought the chief Burgomaster Forkenbach into much disfavor. The Berliners call it the Forkenbacon, Forkenbacon. And there is certainly a joke in this description, even though it was necessary to replace the word Braunen by its obsolete equivalent Bacon in order to combine it into a whole with the name of the Burgomaster. The voice of Europe once made the cruel joke of, of changing a potentate's name from Leopold to Cleopold on account of the relations he had at one time with a lady with the first name of Cleo. This undoubted product of condensation keeps alive an annoying illusion at the cost of a single letter. Proper names in general fall 
easy victims to this kind of treatment by the joke technique. There, there were in Vienna two brothers named Saling, Salinger, one of whom was a Bosinsul. This provided a handle for calling him Saint Salinger, while his brother, to, dis to distinguish him, was given the unflattering name of Schuschalinger. This was this was convenient and certainly a joke. I cannot say whether it was justified, but jokes do not as a rule inquire much into that. The German for fool, one footnote, Schuschal means monstrous creature, two footnote. I have been, uh, page 1627, I have been told the following condensation joke. A young man who had hit her to let a gay life abroad paid a call, after a considerable absence, on a friend living here. The latter was surprised to see an Eiching wedding ring on his visitor's hand. What? he exclaimed. Are you married? Yes, was the reply. Trauchen, but true. The joke is an excellent one. The word trauchen combines both components, eiching, changed into trauring, and is sentenced traurig, aber, aber war, sad but true. The effect of the joke is not inter interfered with by the fact that here the composite word is not like familionar, an unintelligible and otherwise non-existent structure, but one which coincides entirely with one of the uh, one of the two elements represented. In the course of conversation, I myself once unintentionally provided the material for a joke that is once again quite analogous to familionar. I was talking to a lady about the great services that had been rendered by a man of science who I considered had been unjustly neglected. Why, she said, the man deserves a monument. Perhaps he will get one some day, I replied. But Momentan has very little success. Monument and Momentan are opposites. The lady proceeded to unite them. Well, let us wish him a Momentan success, success. Traurig would have meant sad. Trauring is a synonym for eiring. One, two, a non-existent word, monumental, as in English would have been expected. Page 16.1 Jokes are per particularly apt to change one of the vowels in a word. Thus, Thus Hevesi, 1888, 87, writes of an anti-imperial Italian poet who was nevertheless obliged later to eulogize a German emperor in hexameters. Since he could not exterminate the Caesar and Caesar's, Caes Caesar's, he at last eliminated Gasudin Seisuras, example of which Heine is guilty, having for a long time represented himself to his lady as an Indian prince, he throws off the mask and confesses, Madame, I have deceived you. <clears throat> I have no more ever been in Calcutta, Calcutta. Then the Calcutan Braten, roast Calcutta fowl, that I ate for luncheon yesterday. The mistake in this joke clearly lies in the fact that the two similar words in it are not merely similar, but actually identical. The bird which he, he had eaten roast is so called because it comes, or is supposed to come, from the same Calcutta. Fisher, 1889 to 78, has devoted much attention to these forms of joke and tries to distinguish them sharply from play upon words. A pun is a bad play upon words, since it plays upon the words not as a word but as a sound. 
The plea upon words, however, passes from the sound of the word to the word itself. On the other hand, he classes such jokes as familiar, antigone, antique, or ni, etc., among the sound jokes. I see no necessity for following him in thus. In a play upon words, in our view, the word is also only a sound image, to which one meaning or another is attached. But here, too, linguistic usage makes no sharp distinctions, and it treats puns with contempt and play upon words with a certain respect. These judgments of value seem to be determined by considerations other than technical ones. It is worth while well, in high spirits <clears throat> can for considerable periods of time answer every remark addressed to them with a pun. One of my friends who is a model of discretion where his serious achievements in science are concerned, is apt to boast of this ability. When on one occasion he was holding the company breathless in this way, and when he was finally begged to stop, he agreed to, on the condition that he was appointed poeta gaulaureatus. Both of these, however, are excellent jokes of condensation, with formation of composite words, I am lying here auf der Lauer for making Galauer puns. In any case, we can already gather from the disputes about the delimitation of puns and play upon words that the former will not be able to help us to discover a completely new joke technique. If, in the case of puns, we give up the claim for the use of the same material in more than one sense, Nevertheless, the accent f falls on rediscovering what is familiar, on the correspondence between the two words that make up the pun, and consequently puns merely form a subspecies of the group which reaches its peak in the play upon words proper. Edin, chapter 5, 1, 2, Galauer, equals pun, auf de lauer, on the lookout. <coughs> Page 1728, Part 5, The Motives of Jokes. Jokes as a Social Process. It might seem superfluous to talk about the motives of jokes, since the aim of getting pleasure must be recognized as a sufficient motive for the joke work. But on this but on the one hand, the possibility cannot be excluded of other motives as well as having a share in the production of jokes, and on the other hand, bearing in mind some familiar experiences, we must raise the general question of the subjective determinants of jokes. Two facts in particular make this necessary. Although the joke work is an excellent method of getting pleasure out of physical pro psychical processes, it is nevertheless evident that not everyone is equally capable of making use of that method. The joke work is not at everyone's command, and although only a few people have a plentiful amount of it, and these are distinguished by being spoken of as having wit. Fitz. Wit appears in this connection as a special capacity, rather in the class of the old mental faculties, and it seems to emerge fairly independently of the others such as intelligence, imagination, memory, etc. We must therefore presume that presence in these witty people of special inherited dispositions or psychical determinants which permit or favor the joke work. I fear that we shall not get very far in exploring this question. We can only succeed here and there in advancing from an understanding of a particular joke to a knowledge of the subjective determinants in the mind of the person who made it. It is a remarkable coincidence that precisely the example of the joke on which we began our investigations with, of the technique of jokes also gives us a glimpse into the subjective determinants of jokes. I refer to Heine's joke, which is our 
also been considered by hymens and lips. I sat bef I sat beside Solomon Rothschild, and he treated me quite as his equal, quite familiarly. Bader, Bader von Luca, <clears throat> 1730, last page. The presence of similar subjective determinants may be suspected in some other of the great scoffer's jokes, but I know of no other in which this can be demonstrated so convincingly. For this reason, it is not easy to make any more definite statement about the nature of these personal determinants. Indeed, we shall be disinclined in general to claim such complicated determinants for the origin of every individual joke. Nor are the jokes produced by other famous men any more easily accessible to our examination. We get an impression that the subjective determinants of the joke work are often not far removed from those of neurotic illness. When we learn, for instance, of Lichtenberg, that he was a severely hypochondriacal man with all kinds of eccentricities. <clears throat> the great majority of jokes and especially those that are constantly being newly produced in connection with the events of the day, are circulated anonymously. One would be curious to learn from what sort of people such productions originate, if one has occasion as doctor to make the acquaintance of one of those people who, though not remarkable in other ways, are well known in their circle as jokers. And the originators of many <clears throat> viable jokes. One may be surprised to discover that the Joker is a disunited personality, disposed to neurotic disorders. The insufficiency of documentary evidence, however, will certainly prevent our setting up a hypothesis that a psychoneurotic constituent of this kind is a habitual or necessary subjective condition for the construction of jokes. A more transparent case is offered, once more, by the Jewish jokes, which as I have already mentioned, page 1705, are ordinarily made by Jews themselves, while the anecdotes about them from other sources scarcely ever rise above the level of comic stories or of brutal derision. What determinates their participating in the jokes themselves seems to be the same as in the case of Heine's familiarly joke, and its significance seems to lie in the fact that the person concerned finds criticism or aggressiveness difficult so long as they are direct and possible only along circuitous paths. <clears throat>